Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. This is the 700th episode of the podcast, and I wanted to start by thanking our listeners for helping us reach this milestone. Our guest uh, to help us mark this occasion is Scott Galloway, who returns to the broadcast. He seems ubiquitous today from his podcast, Pivot, and the Prof G Pod, his venture-backed ed tech company, Section 4, Prof G Media, which produces not only his podcast, but a weekly newsletter, YouTube videos, a column for New York Magazine, and a book uh, every year or two, it seems. And uh, speaking of which, his latest book is due out uh, in late September, September 27th, and it's called Adrift, America in 100 Charts. Prof G, Scott Galloway, welcome back to Technovation. It's uh, great to speak with you, and congratulations on your success. Uh, thanks, Peter. Although when you were describing it, I thought like it was a little bit like there's to resist is futile. This guy's overexposed. <laughs> <laughs> it started. It wasn't, you know, it, it sounds like, uh, I don't know that people, people need a break uh, from, from all things Scott. But anyway, it's good to be with you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I wanted to uh, sort of, I guess, a related uh, topic to the one you've noted. You have stated as a goal to be the most influential thought leader in the history of business, a uh, pretty big goal to have. And I wonder, what does that mean exactly? And and, and why is that your goal? Uh, I'll take it in reverse order, mostly narcissism, um, uh, wanting to <laughs> be relevant, fear of death, um, economic security, mostly selfish reasons. I also feel as if... Um, I have something to say around how technology and monopoly power and uh, kind of unchecked corporate interests are uh, the externalities of that have always existed, but I think they've gotten worse. And as I've gotten older and experienced fatherhood and look back on how fortunate I was to be born when I was born, to be born who I was. Uh, and some of my struggles as a young man, I'm spending a lot more time thinking about uh, young men who I think are struggling in our society, and I want to have a positive influence there. So, you know, it's a mixture of of wanting to be influential for some of the for some good reasons and some less good reasons. <laughs> and, and what progress do you feel like you're making towards that? Still time, still time, Peter. <laughs> I'd also like to be a I'd also like to be a Navy SEAL and a Broadway dancer. So I got some work to do. Um, yeah, I like I like to work. I know you like to work. I, you said this is what the four hundredth podcast, seven hundredth. So I'm okay. So you like to work too, and I see a lot of your columns. Um, yeah, I feel I feel as if I've you know I kind of hit a tipping point a couple of years ago where after working my ass off for thirty years, I was an overnight success. It feels like a bunch of things hit, whether it was a book that sold well or my mm -hmm. podcast with Kara Swisher. So it it feels like you hit a tipping point. I got a lot more attention, I guess. Um, that comes at a price. You get a lot more criticism and it's warranted. And there's kind of an industrial complex around call out culture based on how much awareness you have. And sometimes I just get it wrong. So I deserve it. But yeah, it feels like three, four years ago, things kind of like leveled up in terms of the number, the amount of attention I was capturing around some of the stuff I was saying. And, and um, is there a predecessor whose career you'd most like to emulate? Yeah, Peter Drucker. Uh, I just loved his storytelling based on top of economics. And I loved how forward leaning he was. He predicted that office buildings would be the new pyramids that they would, that people would come to marvel at them, but they'd serve no functional purpose. And he said that in the sixties and it looks like in 2022, he might've finally gotten that right. And I just love the way he wrote my father. It also has some emotional connection there. My father gave me his books when I was a junior in high school. Uh, so I just liked him. I liked the data. I liked the rigor. I thought he was fearless. I thought he connected economics to human behavior, which I really enjoy. So he's sort of a, he's a role model. Yeah. And like him, you've, uh, you have an area of expertise, but you've now found so many different adjacencies. If there was a bullseye in the sort of branding and marketing area, uh, you've now, you know, and perhaps all, always, but but you've developed a, a a brand that goes so much further beyond your your initial areas of expertise or the areas in which you were best known or the, the areas that you teach at uh, the Stern School, for example. How have you how have you thought about the the ways in which you stretch uh, from from the, play, the 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 home that you kept in terms of the initial disciplines that that were your areas of expertise? Yeah, I'm reminded of what you say every day about, you know, every day someone tells me to stay in my lane. I think that when you're a thought leader, it's kind of like being a surfer. And that is you want to get in front of the right thought leadership to be a thought leader around, I don't know, around gap accounting, 
Um, I, I think you'll get some notoriety, but you want to pick the sector that you want to develop domain expertise in. And the sector I picked for the first 15, 20 years of my life was brand. And I just saw with Google kind of early on that the importance of brand, uh, the intangible associations created in a brand code and then kind of pounded away by this really cheap medium called broadcast television, that the sun had passed midday, that Don Draper was kind of being drawn and quartered, and that we were moving to a new era of sort of technological innovation and just spent a ton of time writing about it, thinking about it. Uh, wrote a book about it more as an exercise to try and really understand it called The Four, where I really tried to tear apart Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. And how big tech disrupts traditional industry for me has been my thing. And that's been the gift that keeps on giving because the reshaping of our economy and our society at the hands of big tech is something that people just never seem to get sated on. So I can call almost any media outlet and say, I have some views on Amazon losing out to Cigna and the acquisition of a healthcare firm, and they'll let me come on and talk about it. So I say to people, um, and I always like to try and translate it to a learning for someone younger, because I, I get calls all the time from academics and journalists saying, what's next? Where should I be focusing my human capital? You want to get in front of the right way. You'd bet, rather be a good surfer with great waves than an amazing surfer with bad waves. Mm -hmm. Moving forward the next 20 years, the intersection between healthcare and technology and also the intersection between human capital and the economy. I, the number one question I get from CEOs and journalists is work from home question mark. Mm. Like, where does it, where does it kind of level out? Are office buildings going away? Does it depend on the cohort? What does it mean for culture? But just, and here's the thing, no one's really established thought leadership or what feels like a kind of a cogent view that we're all signing up for. It, it just, it's all over the map and I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm going to stick with this kind of big tech thing. But if I were a younger academic or journalist, I would think, you know, I want to get, I want to get into that. And, and anyone who needs to get into it, anyone who tells you to stay in your lane, it's like your lane is whatever you spend a ton of time researching and you can confidently point to data. Uh, and say, I, you know, I have a view here. So I wouldn't be scared to kind of move outside of your lane. I mean, you know, I don't, I get calls on brand strategy and I don't even return them because I'm just sort of, you know, kind of sick talking about it. And I don't really think it matters how many people are watching the Academy Awards anymore. It's an interesting talking <laughs> point, but it's not what I want to spend my life thinking about. Yeah, very interesting. You've also mentioned that TV is empty calories, and <clears throat> you've noted it is by far the lowest ROI of any of the medium that you engage with, but you it's yet it's something you continue to return to. Um, why is that? I'm curious, like what why is TV still have an allure for you if in fact that's the case? I'm I'm being very honest. It's ego. It's fun to see yourself on TV. Uh, mm -hmm. you grew up you grew up just thinking these are the most interesting, impressive people, the people you saw on TV, whether it was you know, the Brady's or, you know, the A-Team or the star, you know, Dirk Benedict and Battlestar Galactic, you know, or, or Bill Bixby, the Incredible Hulk. Those are the people I looked up to. So when I see someone on TV or I see myself on TV, it's just very rewarding. But I'm a fairly data-driven person. And if I look at inbound inquiries, if I look at awareness, if I look at um, economic opportunities presented to me and I try and develop any sort of attribution or honest attribution, TV is empty calories. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's almost like people watching TV. It's almost like when they're driving, you can drive a hundred miles and just not remember any piece of the road. I think TV has become so passive, so littered with marginal content, at least, at least that supported TV, which is typically what I'm on, you know, whether it's, you know, a business television network that it's very low, the burn is not very clean at all. And the medium really is a message. If somebody comes up to me and high fives me and says, hey, Prof G, love you or love your videos. I know it's a video, a YouTube thing. It evokes a certain kind of fun emotion. If someone comes up and wants to have a very um, thoughtful conversation or writes me a really long email, it's something about the book or the newsletter. And if someone comes up to you, and this is the fascinating part of mediums, and start speaking to you literally as if they're your friend. And now you, you have to check yourself and say, I do, do I know this person? It's the podcast, because not only is the medium longer and more intimate, but the majority of people are now listening to podcasts on their AirPods. And there's something about being physically in someone's ear that creates a level of intimacy. Um, so I find podcasts right now are probably, as is the reason I'm here with you, the greatest ROI. That if someone tunes in to listen to your podcast, 
And you and I can have a nuanced conversation and I have the chance to really explore and bang on topics and people like or don't like what you say, it creates a real emotional resonance versus a four minute hit on CNBC. Um, and then I got a quarter million subscribers to my newsletter. That's more for like cloud cover around sort of intellectual rigor, put a ton of work into those. But the medium is the message. And the other thing is uh, that I've always pursued very early on in my consulting career. I worked with William Sonoma and I remember them saying that the moment they got someone to buy their products are more than one medium. The moment they could get someone to buy catalog and store or store and website, their lifetime value doubled. And so what I try to do is offer enough mediums that I can get people to consume my content through multiple mediums because then they become much more loyal or interested in your content. So I think multi-channel is, is, has this sort of accretive effect or exponential effect. How do you manage your time across the variety of things that you're doing? Uh, I think there's an illusion that I'm a workaholic. Um, I love not working. I'm outstanding at it. I'm in Vegas right now. I'll do this podcast with you. I'll go have breakfast. It's early out here and then I'll go work out and then I'll hit the pool and um, I have friends coming in. I, I, you know, I don't, I work hard. I love, I, I really like to work. I used to work way too much, but I don't work as hard as people think. And the lesson is pretty straightforward. Greatness is in the agency of others. People think that I'm podcasting, holding a camcorder up, doodling charts in my kitchen. Prop G Media is 11 people. I have three analysts, uh, two creatives, a tech person who follows me everywhere, um, two podcast producers. And the only thing that I think I've, uh, that I feel really confident about is I've always enjoyed and had some talent at finding and retaining exceptional people. But if you want to be if you want to be, uh, you know, in thought leadership and taken really seriously and have a big sphere of influence, it's about having a lot of people to help you scale. And I've always tried to arbitrage the tax system. I don't like current income. I will take almost all my current income and reinvest it back in the business or in compensation of people, which is an investment in the business and try and build an enterprise that at some point I might sell and then recognize, you know, capital gains. And it's a great way to force yourself to save because you don't raise your standard of living, although I've done that dramatically over the last 10 years, but I'm, I'm always trying to build enterprises as opposed to building, you know, a job or current income, if you will. But I, I you know, 10 people, you know, only two or three of people will touch this podcast, but I put out a newsletter today on No Mercy No Mouse. Eight people touch that from an editor to a proofreader, to a fact checker, to two graphics design people, to our guy trying to figure out how to get a quarter of a million emails out without it ending up in everybody's spam folder. Hmm. Yeah, really interesting. Um, I, I also wanted to ask you, uh, you, you've been a, not only a participant in, but a major critic of uh, university education for a whole mm -hmm. range of reasons, cost reasons, uh, you know, uh, lack of innovation in many ways. And you've put your money where your mouth is with section four, uh, developing what you refer to as an unlimited MBA quality online business education. But you still have your affiliation with NYU and the Stern School as well. Um, how do you, how do you think about the balance between those? And I mean, at what point does, does, uh, d does your, your, your tenure at, uh, at NYU become something that's expendable because of your affiliation with and continued drive to, to grow section four? Yeah. So, I mean, NYU has just been such a powerful brand or a powerful platform for me. And, and the people there have been really generous. I'm not sure I'd be as patient with me as they are with me. Um, because I do kind of bite the hand that doesn't feed me. I've returned all my compensation for the last decade to try and give me some sense of you know, license to say the things I say, but they're just incredibly flexible with me. And I have wonderful friends there and there's just no getting around it. I think, I think now people would probably listen to me because I know people like you, but I don't think people would have listened to me 10 or 15 years ago if it was just some guy talking about brand. It's just the platform is really powerful just as your you know, your brand is really powerful. Your platform is really powerful. So, and it provides a halo of credibility. Um, I don't, I've been at NYU 20 years. I'd like to be there another 10 or 20. I may not be because I say some pretty provocative things. And I think at some point the wrong, you know, the wrong or the right person will get fed up with me kind of shit posting them and say, we don't need this. Um, uh, section four has been tough. It was like, we, it was huge. We got off to a huge start, 1,200 people per class during COVID, and we knew we had wind in our sails, but we didn't realize how, how much the winds would die down when COVID ended. And that business, 
you know, business is off. Business was growing 70% a year. And this year will probably be down 30 or 40% because nobody wants to be in their home staring at a screen and learning right now. So that's been tough. Meanwhile, education or traditional education at an elite university has never been stronger. And I would argue it's strong for the wrong reasons that we've embraced this LVMH rejectionist uh, NIMBY model where we artificially constrain supply such that we can grow um, or raise prices faster than inflation, constantly coming up with new departments and administrators that never go away. I don't think, I think, elite, I think every morning me and my colleagues wake up and uh, ask ourselves some version of the same question. And that is how do we uh, increase our compensation while reducing our accountability. And it's like, I know, let's come up with departments. There's no measurable outcome. How do you measure the effectiveness of a leadership and ethics department? Uh, we have diversity and inclusion departments now at every major university. So we have a diversity and inclusion department at what are the most diverse and inclusive places in the world. And I think as we bring in more people from different backgrounds, we need additional resources to ensure that they can adopt to a college atmosphere. But these costs never go away. It, these departments have two or three vice chancellors or directors making 150 to 250,000 a year plus plus admin plus their assistants plus office space and they never go away and as a result you have seen administrative bloat skyrocket and i would argue it's the primary culprit behind what has been this transfer of one and a half trillion dollars in wealth from middle class households to the endowments in administrators and faculty of universities and rather than use technology and that capital to expand our freshman enrollments and take uh, higher ed back to where it was when I applied to UCLA, where there was a 76% admissions rate, such that we could educate and lift up the unremarkable, we've decided that we're an Hermes bag and we want to identify the top 1%, the frequently remarkable and kids of rich kids, kids of rich people, and turn them into billionaires. And I just think we've absolutely lost the script in higher ed. The cartel is more corrupt than OPEC. There's no reason we should. We all raise our prices exactly the same amount every year. And what ends up happening is a lot of good kids that aren't freakishly remarkable or the parents don't know someone on the board of an elite university end up getting arbitrage down to a mediocre university and getting a Hyundai certification for a Mercedes price. And I think we, when you stick um, student loan documents in front of somebody with an NYU logo behind you. People have borrowed more money to attend NYU than any university in the world. And if you borrow money to go to Stern, it's a good deal. The average salary of the kids coming out of Stern is $212,000. That's extraordinary. So you could borrow a quarter of a million dollars and still make an argument that it's worth it. Somebody getting a history or philosophy degree that borrows $200,000 in NYU, I think we know that's not a good idea but we put the logo behind us and have a nice, charming, high EQ person shove the paperwork in front of them, sign here, here, and here. And it puts tremendous strain on families. It's, it's totally corrupt. And then when they default, uh, we're not on the hook for any of it. So uh, a combination of self-aggrandizement and arrogance, inability to change, tenure, which is nothing but student debt, reformatted in the form of this you know, BS notion that a lot of these people need some sort of protection because of the provocative things we're saying. We haven't said anything provocative at the business school in 40 years. I mean, what, what I mean, you could argue the law, of, you know, the law school, sure, I get it. Humanities get it. What, the difference between deep water and blue water economics, that's going to get you fired? No, it's not. So uh, I, I think higher ed, I think we've really lost the script around higher ed. I think some I'm making broad generalizations. I think there are some universities who are doing the best. The University of California has committed to adding the freshman enrollments of an entirely new university over the next 10 years. I'm involved with the University of California. But I think a lot of elite universities who, like my school, pay their president $5 million. Any president who wouldn't take the president position at a university for a million, only $5 million, you don't want as your president. And so I, I find the whole thing just uh, uh, obnoxious and wrong. And I think we're preying on the hopes and dreams of the middle class and, you know, leveraging this fetishization and kind of this dictum where you failed as parents if you don't get your kid through a traditional four-year degree. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do something about it, but at the same time, I'm going to continue to, you know, affiliate with NYU. Yeah, it's interesting. That was a word salad. <laughs> <laughs> a good one, though. I mean, I appreciate, I appreciate the perspective and the reflection. Obviously, again, the uh, you know, you're, 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 you're part of, part of it. You gain mightily from it. You're also competing with it. I, you know, ironically, I, yeah. I, I, I do find it very interesting and you're straying into some of the important points that you also raise in your latest book, Adrift, American, a hundred charts. 
Um, you, you note that just as in 1945 or 1980, America is once again a nation at a crossroads. And, you know, you've you've referred uh, um, to yourself as a person who's gla glass half empty, Scott. Uh, and the charts you developed and the analysis you go through paints a fairly bleak picture uh, mm -hmm. of where we are. You've also noted in many cases, I've heard you say this on your podcast many times, that there's nothing wrong about America that can't be solved with what's right about America. Um, so I, I wonder, how do you, you know, as you sit here now, how do you feel about the future of your country? Uh, that's a generous question. So um, I am a pessimist, but whenever I really sit down and look at the data, I think there's a lot of um, wonderful points of light. You know, even so you can be a pessimist. We have one in five households or food with kids were food insecure pre-pandemic. And it went to it went to like one in 11 with a simple child tax credit. We were able to reduce child poverty by 50 percent. Now, the bad news is we decided at the last minute to strip it out of the infrastructure bill. But the good news is I'm not sure any of us even thought we could reduce it 50% in a year. We like to think there's this, what I call illusion of complexity that big tech and society lay on us to try and pretend that the problems around teen depression or polarization online are just too complex to address. That's not true. Or that something like child poverty is too many factors to address. That's not true. All of these problems are solvable. We have we have stared down much bigger issues than any of the things that ail us now. I think we just need to be uh, uh, forceful about it, devote the requisite resources. But I'm a big fan. I'm kind of a World War II junkie. And there's this, uh, I think her name is Marina Amalo, uh, this incredible photographer who's been colorizing World War II photos. And my favorite is this photo of a landing craft who just put the front um, barrier down and all of these uh, soldiers are starting to wade through the water, heading towards Omaha Beach, of which two of the three wouldn't leave the beach, get off the beach. Average age was 26. Average salary on an inflation-adjusted basis was 800 bucks. And I imagine them flipping around and somehow seeing through time and space all of us in our era now in America, and uh, and them saying, well, "What are your biggest problems? Well, income inequality." Well, polarization, people are really coarse. Well, we've had an uptick in teen depression. People are lonely. They're not getting married. They're not making connections. And they go, those are serious problems. But boss, look at what the fuck I'm facing. Look at what I'm facing. And you can't solve that. You've had since, as I wade into these shores, you know, uh, go for it 75 years later, you now produce more output in three weeks than we produced in a year. You have vaccines to solve some of the most complicated diseases in the world. You've eradicated diseases. I mean, you can skirt along the surface of the atmosphere, 0.8, the speed of sound. I just, I can't imagine they would just see an inkling of what we've accomplished and what we face and go, oh yeah, if I can handle this, you guys can absolutely handle that. So I force myself in every presentation I give to have a section called silver linings because I struggle with anger and I'm, 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 you know, I'm not an optimistic guy. But if you really look at a sober analysis of how we got here, the skills we have, the capital we have, the innovation we have, the generosity that's sort of built into the DNA of Americans, uh, uptick in empathy. And the most wonderful chart in the book, I think, is that people all over the world uh, universally are spending more time helping people they will never meet planting the trees of the shade of which they will never sit under. So I think the most optimistic thing, I, I'm, I'm really good at pointing out all the problems and deficiencies in America. But what I have to constantly lay over is that none of these problems are insurmountable. And I think the media, um, gas prices go up 90 days in a row. There's 21 headlines in the New York Times. They go down 72 days in a row. There's one headline in the New York Times. If you were forced, if we said to you and all of your colleagues in the world of journalism, you can only have one headline for the last 100 years, it would probably be that US, US UK, and Russia with, with brains, brawn, and blood turn back fascism. That would probably be the one headline if we could only do it for 100 years. If we could only do it for the last 50 years, I think it would be something along the lines of unfathomable prosperity led by the United States and China. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be polarization. It wouldn't be extremism. It wouldn't be nationalism. It would, you know, the, the headlines uh, would be much more positive if you had to kind of summarize it all. So I forced myself to do that. And writing the book, 
you can drill down and really see. And I think it's important to diagnose what the disease is, what the problem is, the opioid crisis. Yeah, young people uh, uh, having a lot less money, uh, distinct efforts to transfer money from the young to old resulting in opioid addiction, uh, inability to create as many economically and emotionally viable men resulting in lower marriage rates, lower birth rates. I think all of these things are really serious. Social media, social goes on media in 2012, and we see an 80% uptick in hospital admissions of girls um, engaging in self-harm. I mean, we just, there are big issues and there's no denying that they are happening. But the good news is we know why they're happening and they're absolutely addressable. Mm -hmm. And you actually have a, a great section at the end, which is sort of what we must do. Uh, you, you include things like simplify the tax code, rebuild regulatory systems, uh, uh, enact a one-time wealth tax, support children and family formation, invest in national service, among others. I, I'm wondering, as you think across the recommendations you have, how many of them do you think are realistic, uh, are implementable, and which ones are, I mean, there, there's no reason why not to include some others that are going to be a lot harder, simplifying the tax code, rebuilding the uh, regulatory system, two pretty tough ones, for example. But um, how do you think about that sort of prioritization and, and, and what's feasible? Uh, yeah. So look, is it realistic? Are there, are there huge issues? Yeah. But you know, <laughs> what was it? Uh, 50 years ago, we sent three men into space, <laughs> a quarter of a million miles and figured out a way to land them on. We didn't even know what they were landing on and somehow got them there and figured out a way to get them back home alive. So it just feels like these are enormous problems and they're fucking molehills compared to the Everest that we've climbed as the nation before. So taking any one in, you know, in, in isolation, yeah, that'll never happen. That'll, well, why not? The world isn't what it is. It's what we can make of it. Um, uh, national service, I think, is something that's worked in Israel. It works in countries in Northern Europe. And it's easy for me to say now that I've aged out. But uh, I find it's, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about polarization. 54% of Democrats are worried about their kid marrying a Republican. A third of each party sees the other party, members of the other party, as a mortal enemy. And you just don't have to go that far back in history or just have some sober conversation to recognize Americans will never have greater allies than other Americans. And so the, 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 the question is, well, how do we restore that connective tissue? And the reason why we had so much more civil dialogue at a national level, at least in politics, and we're able to get great legislation through, was because the majority of our elected leaders had served in the same uniform. And they absolutely saw themselves as Americans first, well ahead of the Democrat or Republican. Like, oh, we, you know, I served alongside of this guy or gal, right? And so I think some sort of national service, not necessarily military, but what Israel does, social services. Uh, I thought uh, the novel coronavirus was an opportunity to try and rally um, uh, a national service or a corona core, uh, given that young people didn't experience the kind of mortality that older people, I, I thought that would have been a big opportunity, but I still think national service and creating more connective tissues give chance, kids a chance who are increasingly segregated, a chance to mix with other kids from different ethnic backgrounds, different income backgrounds, and for God's sakes, before they even develop this crazy polarization around politics. Um, tax code went from 400 pages to 4,000. There's no reason it can't go back. Herman Cain was the leading Republican candidate for a hot minute because he, he proposed the same thing that Ross Perot proposed, a flat tax. I mean, we can, we should be able to kind of uncluster the clustering. When you, you know, when you, when you can sail by starlight, you want to sail at night. And that's what the wealthy and corporations have done. It's like, let's make the tax code so complex that we Probably the brightest person in my universe is my tax lawyer who helps me avoid taxes. And people say, well, why don't you write a check to the government? You're so preachy. And it's like, well, realistically, I'm not going to disarm unilaterally, but I know the answer. I know that basically a more simplified tax code that turn, returns our nation to a progressive tax structure, which we had until about 10 years ago. Um, there's also just some interesting data here that the kind of Conventional wisdom is that it's poor and middle income people that are really getting screwed in terms of our tax system. And there's some truth to that because they don't get or their income from capital gains. But the group that's actually getting the worst deal, relatively speaking, are the workhorses, as defined by a couple who's maybe a chiropractor. She's a chiropractor. Um, you know, he's a lawyer. They make between three hundred thousand and eight hundred thousand. Live in an expensive urban metro. Play, you know, work hard. Play by the rules. Great certification. Make a great living. In most cities where those jobs are, are, 
are abundant, you're probably looking at a 45 to 50% tax rate. And they're rich enough to have a nice lifestyle and live in those cities, but they're not wealthy enough to aggregate enough income to move into the capital gains ecosystem. So, you know, there's some, I think there's some conventional wisdom that's just not correct, but we can absolutely de decomplexify the tax structure, national service. I think we need programs that should begin transferring wealth back to young people. Young people as a percentage of GDP have seen their wealth, that is people under the age of 40 go from 19% of GDP to 9%, whether it's capital gains, mortgage tax, social security, there's no, there's no one and a half trillion dollar a year program that puts money in the hands of young people. The wealthiest generation in history, the wealthiest cohort in the history of the planet gets a trillion and a half dollars transferred from young people to old people in the form of social security. And it just, it, it, we now have young people who are not very economically viable. We have men especially struggling. Seven to 10 high school valedictorians are girls. For every one male college graduate in the next five years, there's gonna be two female college graduates. And that has a lot of knock-on effects because the bottom line is, we don't like to say this on the left, women don't wanna mate socioeconomically horizontally or down. So women who have college degrees aren't interested in mating with men without college degrees. And I don't think you're going to change that for a while. So what you have is uh, an enormous, enormously growing group of what is the most dangerous person on the planet, and that's a lonely, broke man. And the most unstable societies in the world, the most violent societies in the world, all have one thing in common, and that is young men who aren't connecting to work, not connecting to a relationship, not connecting to school. And we are producing uh, millions of them in this country. So... But I think we can fix that. I think vocational programs, expanding college enrollments, uh, lower, uh, a more progressive tax structure. Why on earth do we tell people, do, do we tax people who make money with their sweat, current income? And then we've decided that the money money makes is more noble. Shouldn't it absolutely be flipped? Shouldn't the taxes be higher if you're making money off stocks and bonds, which likely means you're rich versus making money, you know, bringing me my Cobb salad sandwich at Panera? I mean, it just feels like we have gotten this all bass backward. But, uh, you know, Reagan had one income tax level. A Republican felt that no income is income. And then corporations got involved and figured out a way. And wealthy people will always weaponize government if there's not strong pushback. And they'll, you know, they'll talk a big game. We talk a big game. We save the whales by night. We complain about the water quality. And then during the day, we piss in the well. And we have to have a, 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 you know, a democratic government that pushes back and says, at the end of the day, the cohort we are representing is always going to be the middle class. That's how community, that's how societies live and die. Yeah, really interesting. And, and uh, related to all of this, and maybe uh, as a counterpoint to some of the points you're raising, among your recommendations is enable other pathways to upward mobility. And I wanted to linger on that for a little long longer, mm -hmm. Scott, as to what are some of those? What, what are some of your ideas in terms of the other pathways up? So simply put, I think, I think we need to stop fetishizing the traditional four-year degree from an elite university. There's this pathway that every parent and kid is focused on, and we all track towards it. I'm tracking toward it with my kids, that they need to get to MIT or an Ivy League school and end up at Google or KKR. And anything kind of verging from that is a disappointment. And it creates not only it's not only not true and it's bad for the economy, it creates an unbelievable emotional stress. Uh, when my kids come home with a B or God forbid a C, the whole house comes down. And, uh, you know, young men, they're, they're more risk aggressive. They have a more difficult time paying attention. They're suspended at twice the rate on a behavior adjusted basis. A girl gets called into the principal's office, a boy gets called in, the exact same behavioral infraction, boy is twice as likely to be suspended. Two thirds to 80% of primary and uh, high school teachers are women. And understandably, they're gonna be more prone to champion girls. The behaviors we measure for in college, testing, discipline, focus, um, girls just biologically do better. So we kind of have persecute is the wrong word, but there's just, if you look at the data 40 years ago, when it was 60, 40 male to female college enrollment, we decided to level up women. That was the right thing to do. When people of color were under indexing in college, we had affirmative action. That was the right thing to do. Now that it's 66, 33 female to male college graduates, there isn't a lot of people calling for male affirmative action. And I actually don't think that's a solution. I think it's an investment. 
But the investment I think that would yield the most benefit right now would be to ask our great public universities that educate two thirds of our students to that in exchange for a fraction of the funding we're spending on student debt relief to expand their enrollment 6% a year using technology and infrastructure, we can absolutely scale that. If we can scale Salesforce and Google 40 and 23% a year, we can scale the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill 6% a year and reduce their costs 2% a year. And we, the government, will pay for that infrastructure and that technology. But you're gonna make, you're gonna get rid of this or, or at least hold administrative bloat flat. And you're gonna offer a plethora of non-traditional certifications, a one-year degree in installing energy efficient HVAC systems, a two-year degree in construction of nuclear power plants, a 12 or 15 month degree in maintenance of all these uh, incredible healthcare machines now that we get you know, poked and, and scanned with now. There are, there are so many mainstream economy jobs that there isn't what I call a real fluid path to 50% of Germans have some sort of vocational certification. It's 5% in America. And anyone who has to get a plumber out to their house, you know, sees these people make pretty good livings. I have dogs, which means you have a carpet cleaner and a furniture cleaner coming out to your house a lot. And I got to know this guy, small business, franchise business. And I did the math. He's making about 140 to 170 grand a year. And the guy is the carpet whisperer. He can get any substance out of a carpet. But it's a nice living. It's a nice living. And so I think there's a lot of people that uh, don't want to borrow the money, don't have the, don't just, just don't want to go to college, don't want to go to traditional college. But I think if the University of California, Berkeley opened a campus in the Inland Empire and said, we're going to produce two, three, 10,000 kids a year who over 12 or 24 months get, uh, and I had some aptitude around math and love computers, uh, give them a degree in cybersecurity. I think there's a, I think there are an insatiable number of appetite of jobs for those people at 100, uh, at 80 to 140 grand a year. So there's, I think there's a lot of, a lot of on-ramps um, we could uh, make it more visible and create you know, create this, get rid of the stigma and the stress when when Bob or Susan in the 11th grade is just a B student and quite frankly says, you know, mom, that, I don't love school. Uh, that's, this, is, this isn't what I want to do. I'm not going to be a doctor. I think vocational training and, and a dramatic expansion of, of opportunities for people like me who didn't have their shit together, but knew they wanted to go to college. I needed that. If I took five years to get through year, I needed that seasoning, and uh, I, I got a two point two seven GPA. Notice how I can always turn everything back to me. I, I got at UCLA a two point two seven GPA, and then what happened? One of the fi the finest public school in the nation, or number two now, Berkeley, let me into graduate school. But that doesn't make any sense in today's age. But you know what? It made sense. And I remember the admissions director calling me and saying, you're not qualified, but you're a native son of California and we're going to give you a shot. Mm -hmm. And they let me in and I got my act together in graduate school. I think like a lot of young men, I didn't really get my act together until my late 20s. And I think it's been a great investment. I know it's paid off for me. That's why I'm here with you now. We're great at crediting our character and our grit for success and blaming the markets for our failures. I have no such illusions. The reason I'm here talking to you is because of the grace and generosity of the University of California Regents and California taxpayers. And uh, we got to go back to that. Uh, I, I believe that higher education or our colleges are sort of the tip of the spear for what America is. And what America used to be 40 years ago was a place that said, we love the unremarkable. If, you're a, a grew up in, if you grew up in Georgia and you have some aptitude for math, you got a shot at going to Georgia Tech or at least the University of Georgia. And you'll get good education at a low price. And you don't have to be freakishly remarkable. And now we've morphed it to, well, let's identify kids of rich people who know someone on our board and maybe we'll give some money. Or a kid who's captain of the lacrosse team has taken seven AP classes and builds wells in Africa. I can prove to all of us that 99% of our children will not be in the top 1%. And then colleges want to identify those people and turn them into, you know, hope to turn them into billionaires. And I can... You know, no institution or bloodline can predict greatness at 18. I wasn't great at 18. Were you great at it? I mean, Peter, like, what were your, pro were you one of those kids that was just on a rocket ship at 18 or were you more like me? Uh, probably somewhere in between, Scott. Where'd you go to school? 
Penn? Oh, no, private school, the yeah. Ivy, Penn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still an amazing school. Okay, what was your tuition when you went? Yeah, it was like in the 20s, 22,000 maybe. Yeah, what is it, high 50s, low 60s now? Yeah. Um, do you think you'd get in now? Not a chance. Not a chance, yeah. yeah. And people say that, and uh, I like how you said that. Your tone was disappointed, not a chance. And what you hear a lot of people say, I'd never get in. And they say it kind of optimistic, like, like they're proud of it. And it's like, <laughs> well, that means your kid's not getting in. Right. Um, so I, look, it, I think it's, it's vocational training and a massive expansion of um, a massive expansion mm. of vocational programs and also some sort of national service that might have, might have great on-ramps into jobs if someone shows real aptitude at a young age in a specific area. One of the things I, I really admired uh, since the last time you and I spoke, Scott, in 2019, you wrote a scathing indictment of, of WeWork uh, and really were enormously influential in uh, the collapse of their IPO. You've, you've uh, made all sorts of predictions. As you point out, you've made lots of predictions that were wrong. Tesla is one you continue to, and, and Tesla and Netflix being ones that you uh, castigate yourself for. Um, but uh I'm I'm wondering now as you look out into the this sort of complex time that we're we're facing right now, are there examples of prominent companies or companies that are overvalued that you think are ripe for some sort of similar comeuppance to uh, to a WeWork or others? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I occasionally find a company that just makes absolutely no sense, and you know, I. I I got my WeWork moment was sort of a big moment for me, uh, but, and I did, and I applied this unbelievable skill called math. I mean, this was a company renting desks that was essentially flying two Bombardier Global Expresses into a mountain every week. They were losing $80 million. I mean, it's just, and Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan had analysts who on the road show were claiming it was worth 50 to $70 billion. I mean, it just, it was literally <laughs> insanity. And uh, so that one was easy. I would say the easiest call I've made in the last year that I've gotten right was Virgin Galactic. Uh, I grew up, I don't know about you, but I grew up, I, I was a subscriber. Do you remember Omni Magazine? You're younger than me. I, I was one of those kids that was really into space. I drank Tang because I thought it made me more astronaut-like, right? And I'm fascinated by space and the notion, this is the most supply and demand constrained business I've ever seen. If they execute perfectly, they'll be able to sell 3,000 tickets a year, and they're, they're going to try and charge $400,000 a ticket. I think that the number of people willing to spend $400,000 to go, you know, two and a half times as high as you go in a 737. Um, uh, and also this entire industry could go to zero when Bob from accounting gets incinerated on the launch pad, which is a very real probability. This is a, space is dangerous. 550 people have gone into space, 11 have not returned. And it's more dangerous than base jumping. You know, Everest is a walk in the park from a risk standpoint versus space. The reason they call it space is it does not want you there. It does not want equipment. It doesn't definitely doesn't want any organism uh, in space. And so you have a demand and supply constrained business, and you had these incredible promoters, these Adam Newman like promoters in Richard Branson and Chamath Palapataya, who are incredibly charismatic, going on CNBC talking about space tourism. Stock hit 60, it's at six bucks. I think it could go easily go to zero. Um, and then there's just so much hype around EV. And I just, so I can continue to, continue to, you know, lash myself, Tesla makes no sense. Uh, BMW is an amazing company, run really well. Toyota's probably the best run automobile company. I think they trade at one to one and a half times revenues. Tesla's trading at seven times. And people, whenever I try to have a sober conversation with an analyst around valuation, they describe it as an energy company where they say it's about climate change. I'm like, they're wrapping steel around a motor. It's an amazing company. I think it should be worth more than any other automobile company, but should it be worth more than the entire auto industry? It just, it's just crazy town. <laughs> and, and, and I want to be clear. I said that when it was at a hundred bucks and now it's, I think at seven or 800, uh, this thing's going to, this thing's going below a hundred bucks at some point. It just makes no Sense. So there's there's a, there's always companies you can find that are still crazily overvalued. People look at Peloton and think that's a great buy. It's only four billion and one point we traded at fifty billion. Okay, it's a connected bike worth four billion dollars. You really got to do the math. Don't anchor off of what it was worth. Is it really worth uh, four billion? And that's not even you know the one I dislike the most. But there are some. There's a lot of a lot of wind has been taken out of those sales. 
especially in the SPAC market, where I think the average SPAC is off 60%. Um, and you're talking about um, uh, the company I hated the most because I thought they were mendacious and I thought it was so ridiculous, overvalued. And it's easy. You know, last year, it's been really easy to be a pessimist was Robinhood. The average account value is $230. About 70% of their revenues come from crypto and options trading. And they're losing accounts, trading is down, and this company's got a, still got a multi-billion dollar market cap. It, I mean, that just makes no sense to me. And it's and it's incinerating cash, it's burning cash. So what you have a, a really good brand here, and you have customer accounts, but they're nowhere near worth. When it comes, stock goes down ninety percent, that means it goes down eighty percent, and then it gets cut in half again. <laughs> And the company's still overvalued. So, I mean, take your pick. It, it was a great time to be a pessimist the last year. The year before that, I was getting beaten up everywhere. I was saying, all right, this thing makes no sense. And it would double. <laughs> so, uh, but I, it, the WeWork one was really unique. I, I was, I, I just couldn't, I almost found it just sort of, like, w- w- what am I missing here? And then on the road show, he started calling it community-based EBITDA, which was EBITDA before their real estate costs. Can you imagine if Equity Office or Post or some of these REITs said, we're going to start reporting profits before the cost of the real estate? Or, I mean, or it just I just found it literally insane. And I also, it really taught me that investment banks and the analysts, they're marketers. There's nothing about their valuation methodology that makes any any type of sense. But I can't think of, if I were going to say, what's the most overvalued company in the world now that's worth more than 500 billion, I would stick with Tesla. Makes absolutely no sense of valuation it's trading on. Yeah, one prediction I think uh, that I've made earlier that I just were talking about Tesla, what Tesla has done is it's taken a low margin manufacturing business that had a total market cap of maybe, I don't know, 200 billion globally. And it's turned it into a higher margin, more technology driven, industry that's now worth over you know a trillion dollars so they've totally expanded the market uh that is going to attract sharks and i think it's going to attract one of the biggest sharks in the world i think apple uh i think i don't know if it's a 18 months 36 months tim cook is going to pull back some dolphin friendly ergonomically um friendly cloth so you know uh, produced by native americans and it'll pull it off this piece of steel wrapped around four tires with an apple logo on it and I think you and me and a lot of our friends are going to get on that list. And that will become the most valuable waiting list in the history of business. Because mm. um, I think Apple just has so much credibility around hardware and the iOS. iOS is so seamless. Uh, they have such incredible design DNA. And I think within six months of just announcing that car on stage, you're going to see 100 to $300 billion in market cap uh, leak from Tesla to Apple. I think Apple looks at Tesla and goes, okay. That that lunch plate is just too big. We're, we'll we'll take some of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's coming. Yeah. And um, also, and I've been saying this for five years, and it's finally coming true. I've always said that I thought Amazon was going to go into healthcare, just by virtue of the fact that their top line growth, in order to maintain that EBITDA multiple, they have to continue to grow the revenues at high teens, low twenties, and that means they got to add a quarter of a trillion dollars in top line revenue in the next five years. And I just don't see how else they can do that versus, uh, other than going into um, healthcare. So I think they're going into healthcare, not because they necessarily want to, but because they have to. You, you've highlighted the, the, some of the reasons why the government hasn't been more active in trying to really split up these companies, the, 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 the trillion dollar uh, companies, the, you know, their constituents, the, the government's constituents, the, the senators and Congress people's constituents love their products and services too much to some extent as, as a mm-hmm. uh, part of the rationale. Uh, but I mean, at what point is, is you know, too big enough? I mean, it's, at what point do they grow to the point where they become, as you point out, they're already in many cases corrosive. You Meta, Facebook is one that you've uh, criticized uh, tremendously, for example, um, among others. Uh, but also, there's a logic to the breaking apart of some of these businesses. You know, the 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 B two B versus the B two C sides of Amazon as a as a logical breaking point, for example. Um, you know, so at what point does the government become more active in this? Do you think what's what's the kind of you know straw that breaks the camel's back there? You know, I don't I don't know because I've been predicting the breakup of these guys, and I've been wrong. And I've spent a lot of time with Senators Klobuchar and Bennett talking about antitrust. And I mean, there's a few reasons. 
first off, they've blown by uh, any sense of power or valuation or anti-competitive behavior relative to other firms, whether it was AT&T or the Aluminums or the Seven Sisters. They're way more powerful and exhibit much more monopoly, monopoly abuse than companies that we broke up a long time ago. And so the question is, why hasn't it happened? And one, at a very basic level, they're just outgunned. Uh, I mean, when Senator Klobuchar tries to write an antitrust bill, it's her and a legislative staff of maybe a half a dozen people working very hard. She's up, up against literally hundreds of lawyers, and she's up against millions of dollars going into the pockets of candidates who need the money mm -hmm. and need to show loyalty to the people who give them money. So they don't, they don't even uh, proactively try and kill the bill. They just don't do anything. They just don't vote for it. It dies in committee. Two, you have only somewhere between four and 8% of our elected representatives have a background in technology or engineering. So it is really hard for a 70 year old. Our elected representatives keep getting older and older and I'm an ageist. I don't understand technology as well as my kids. I go on snap and I feel like I'm going to slip and break a hip. There's something about technology and operating systems that get harder to understand as you get older. So we have this incredibly old cohort that doesn't understand these platforms and and doesn't necessarily want to learn about them and they're outgunned and they've got hundreds of lawyers pit against them and they also one way to look one way to look 80 when you're 70 is to not be an innovator to start feeling very boomer and not acting like you get it that's changed a little i think people i think big tech has jumped the shark and you're for the first time seeing both democrats and republicans be critical of them for different reasons but still, they both don't like them for, for different reasons. But they have, they learned from the sins of the father. Microsoft said, we're not going to give any money. We don't believe in this, this pay for play shit. And they were, you know, they were broken up. Now I was turned over an appeal, but we wouldn't have Google if Microsoft hadn't been under such incredible antitrust scrutiny. We'd all be saying, I don't know, bing it. And so you have. One search company that has 93% share, one company that controls two thirds of social, one e-commerce company controls one and two dollars on the on an e-commerce. I mean, these these are these are monopolies. Apple now has over 50% share of um, uh, operating systems for phones, and it probably has 80% share of revenue in the app economy. So these are these are monopolies, but the our electorate is somewhat outgunned. They don't understand these very complicated topics. Uh, and also there's, there's an idolatry of innovators where it's hard to get public support. And that is, as the nation becomes wealthier, a nation becomes wealthier and more educated, it's reliance on a super being and church attendance goes down, but we still want idols. And the Jesus Christ of our generation is Steve Jobs because technology is the closest thing to mysticism. I don't understand how my phone works. It's, it feels magical. And so when they produce these beautiful products that change our lives and they're also billionaires and we love money in our society, our heroes are billionaires, it creates this worship, this fetishization. And we decide that a guy can defame someone on Twitter, commit securities fraud, uh, commit securities fraud on Twitter, uh, have a personal life that I think a lot of people, at least uh, uh, traditional conservatives, would find very off-putting. And he's our kind of our, you know, Elon Musk has arguably grabbed a Jesus mantle from Steve Jobs. And the same is true of their companies. People are really loath to go after the companies because so many of their, their uh, consumers love them. Now, I do think a lot of a lot of people push back on me and said, Scott, the market will take care of it. There's some legitimacy to their argument. Meta is at a five-year low right now, the stock. Um, I think there might be economic incentive. I believe that all these companies would be worth more in aggregate if they were broken up. I've I predicted that the most valuable company in the world in 2025 will be uh, spun AWS. Yeah. AW, you know, the cloud is the most intoxicating part of technology. Technology is the most intoxicating part of all of business. So if you found the best company in the best category, uh, you just that would be the stock everyone gives their their niece Rachel on her bar mitzvah has in the retirement account. I don't care what the valuation would be. Everybody would feel like they have to own a little AWS. Mm -hmm. And if the stock, and I think that'll happen if the if Amazon stock, if it had continued to go down, I think at some point they would have said we need to unlock some value here with AWS because in a conglomerate strategy, 
essentially investors will find the least attractive business and assign that multiple to the whole thing. Mm. Um, but I think you're going to, I, you know, but the, you know what, I've been saying this Peter for like three years. And at some point, I think it's fair to say, Scott, you are wrong on this because there hasn't been even Senator Klobuchar's legislation is being watered down. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. L- last question for you, Scott. I, I know you're days away from moving to London. What what is we've been talking a lot about what's going on in America and how it can improve. And now you're you're heading off to a new country. What's uh, mm-hmm. what what's what's the story on this new adventure of yours? Yeah, I'm moving to London because of America. America's provided me with so many opportunities um, for growth and economic security that I'm in a position where I can return to the United Kingdom for a few years where my parents were born and raised. I can expose my kids to a different culture, which I've always wanted to do. Uh, So it's not, it has nothing to do. I'm not leaving America because of something I don't like about America. I'm going, you know, I'm going to, I'm moving to London because of how wonderful America has been to me. And I absolutely plan to come back. But, uh, you know, very simply, the reason we're moving to London is because we can. Uh, I don't know if you've spent much time in London. It's a great city. My kids are soccer mad. So it's a chance for me to see a lot of soccer games with my kids. It's a chance to, you know, I'm 57 now, Peter. I've spent the majority of my life kind of molesting the earth. I've just traveled. I've just been circling the globe as a consultant and, and quote unquote speaking and thought leader and all that BS. And one of my observations around different regions around the world is America, hands down, is still the best place to make money. Uh, Europe is the best place to spend it. So, I, you know, as I, as I work less as I get older um, and I think more about where I want to, you know, relax and spend money. Uh, I think London will be a great experience. So it's going to be a great experience for my boys, a lot of soccer. And then, you know, and then I imagine at some point we'll come home. Well, uh, all all the best to you with those new adventures, a new BBC uh, uh, program that I know is in the offing as well. Uh, We'll certainly keep our eyes open for that. But Scott Galloway, thank you so much for joining me today. As always, it's a great, uh, great to get your perspectives and, and uh, I'm honored you take a little time with me. Thank you, Peter. And congratulations on 700 podcasts. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thanks, man. Appreciate it.